talk to you this, this evening. The title of my message is, Are You Ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas? See, it's one thing to be ready for Christmas, and it's another thing to be prepared for Christmas. Um, I want to talk to you this evening about a guy that was the, the father of John the Baptist, named Zechariah. And it's found in Luke chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. Um, seems like the world, it, it just gets a little bit edgier and edgier all the time. It's like, it's like they used to wait till like a couple of weeks before Christmas, and then they now they get catalogs like they come out in August. I was in Walmart before Halloween, and they were putting in Christmas decorations and stuff in Walmart before Halloween. That ain't right. That's not even, that's just like, got to buy things. It, it, and it's, it's, the, it's the pressure. Now, if you survived Black Friday, you might have some money left to buy more Christmas presents. But I'm telling you, the world wants you to spend your money. And, it, and it's, it's just, uh, it seems like uh, the pressure, I don't know if you knew it, but there's only 22 shopping days left till Christmas. 22, in case you were wondering. 21 today, that was yesterday. Okay, you're right. Heresy, it's 21. Okay. <laughs> I think they were waiting for tonight in case. Anyway, so there was a, a couple of guys that was, they was talking about what they was going to get their wife for Christmas. One guy said, well, I think I'm just going to get me some wrapping paper, wrap myself up and tape myself up, and I'm going to give myself to my wife for Christmas. And the guy looked at him and said, well, he said, I'm not getting much from my wife either. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Over 2,000 years ago, Israel, they were ready for a Messiah, but history tells us they weren't prepared for Jesus. They had their expectation. Remember last week we talked about expectations? They had their expectations of, of the Messiah and who the Messiah would be. And when the Messiah came, they didn't, they weren't prepared because they didn't recognize Jesus. The Jewish world was ready for a revolutionary leader, but they, were, they weren't prepared for the Redeemer. Uh, funny how we still pr prioritize the trivial and, and we uh, put off many times the valuable. Today I want to look back at it the life of a Jewish priest, a man who was waiting for the Messiah. And we'll see how God prepared him for a savior. Perhaps we can learn from his experience with the Messiah. His name is Zacharias. And Luke, Luke's gospel gives us a little snapshot of his life. Luke chapter one, verse five. It says, and there was in the days of Herod, the, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Here's a story of John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way for Jesus, also how God prepared the way for John through his aging parents. It's interesting. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. God values you. God doesn't look at your age and value you according to your age. <clears throat> Luke begins the account by telling us that Zacharias lived in the time of Herod the Great. Why they call him the Great, I have no idea. 
he was a pretty brutal man. He wasn't, he, he wasn't godly at all. He, in fact, he had just removed the, the things of God away from, from uh, attempted and to move the things of God away uh, from society. And, and, and many godly people followed his lead. Herod had no religious convict- convictions. So the, so the act of worship in that day became an empty form of rituals and ceremonies. The church has to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of rituals and ceremonies. When we come to church, we don't come to church because it's a ritual. We come to church because we have fallen in love with Jesus. We come to church because we understand that there's a creator that that loves us and he cares for us. We come to meet with God. We come to worship God. We come for his benefit. And the residual benefit is that we get blessed. Every Jewish family had hoped that their son would be the deliverer or the Messiah. Maybe you can identify with Zacharias or or Elizabeth. Um, This couple was disappointed because they was childish. Maybe this Christmas you're facing your own disappointments. Maybe it's not a child or maybe it is. If you can identify with their disappointments, maybe I hope that you can also learn this evening from their examples. Everyone has disappointments. Everyone has disappointments. I got all night. I can wait on you. I said, everyone has disappointments. Thank you. Listen, a lot of people, they think that nobody has ever been where they are. And if the devil can, if he can, if Satan can kind of ostracize you from other people and think you're the only one that's ever gone through it, then, then he, can, he can really rain on your parade. Let me tell you something. Everyone deals with disappointments. Everybody. It's important to know that. It is how we deal with them that shapes our attitude. Our attitude dictates victory or defeat, not our circumstance. Our attitude dictates our victory, not our circumstance. Too many times we let our circumstance dictate to us what kind of an attitude we're going to have. If you don't feel like saying amen, you should say it louder because I'm telling you, our attitude toward our circumstance will, can either bring victory to, to, to us or it will bring defeat to us. It's really about your attitude and my attitude. I need that because I haven't had a good attitude lately. We've been moving. <laughs> We've been moving, and, and uh, I lost my phone Friday, and uh, they raised my team open number today, <laughs> and I'm a little irritated. So it says, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. Cast all your care on him because he cares for you. Despite disappointments, they faithfully served God. They were barren, but they never succumbed to bitterness. Our pain may, not, may or may not be the absence of children, but there are many things that brings disappointment in our lives. Maybe this Christmas, a loved one may not be with you this year because maybe a premature death or illness. Maybe you have experienced financial pressures or strained relationships in your life. Maybe Christmas looks to be a season of disappointment or joy rather than joy. Maybe you're dealing with doubt in your life or fear, perhaps, worry as this Christmas season approaches. God never guarantees a life without pain and disappointments. God never guarantees a life without pain and disappointments. When life hits us with disappointments, we have two options. We can either get bitter or we can get better. 
Bitterness brings anger. Bitterness toward your situation and your circumstance can bring frustration. It can rob us of our joy. But we can become better by trusting and depending on God and finding, listen, finding our fulfillment from God, not from our circumstances. If you're looking toward your circumstances to f- for fulfillment, sooner or later, you will be disappointed. Amen. One thing about this whole world, it's going to change. One lady one time, she says, Pastor, I'm on top of the world. I said, well, hang on, lady. It turns over every 24 hours. <laughs> hang on. It's going to change. Something's going to change. Well, Zacharias was disappointed. He wasn't bitter. He remained, he remained faithful in spite of circumstances. Verse 8, it says, so it was. Everybody say, so it was. <laughs> that while he was serving as priest before God, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of people was praying. The whole multitude of people was praying outside at the hour of incense. In his goodness, God chose an important moment in Zechariah's life to make a divine move. God chose a moment. As a priest, Zechariah learned, served in the temple for two one-week periods a year. He was one of 18,000 priests in Israel at the time. As, it, as was the custom, lots were drawn to determine who would officiate at this sacrifice on a given day. Each priest was allowed to officiate only one time in his lifetime. So this was a very special day in Zachariah's life. And you can imagine if, if you've ever been excited about something, you don't sleep much the night before because you're just like all excited. I can imagine Zachariah was all excited about his opportunity to serve in the temple Zechariah would enter into the holy place, he taking incense. He would then light from the fresh coals as the smoke rose up in the holy place. And the smoke symbolizes the prayers of the people. Outside, the people would be worshiping. At the supreme hour of this priest's life, as smoke rose throughout the room. Listen to this. An angel shows up. He's doing his thing because he's practiced in, in his house. He's not, and all of a sudden, an angel's there Didn't see that coming. (laughs) Listen to this. Verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. To put it lightly, he was troubled. And fear fell upon him. I imagine that's normal. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in the years. Listen, for 450 years, not since the days of Malachi the prophet had they heard anything from God. Can you comprehend 450 years not hearing 
from God. And then Zechariah comes in to do his thing and just to go through the motions and go through the rituals of his religious duty. And then an angel comes, shows up and he gives Zacharias this and Zacharias response is something that might have been one of our responses if we would just be honest with ourselves how will I know this to be true I'm an old guy and my wife well she's an old well she's pretty old too <laughs> he said your prayer has been Answered. How many of you have prayed for something for a long time? And, and you raise your hand if you've prayed for something for a long time. Yeah, thank you. Let me just say this. I want to give you hope for your prayer. God has heard your prayer. And he will answer your prayer. And, and I, just, I just want to say this too, that... When we pray, I just want you to want to challenge you to pray in a manner, pray for things that God would want for you. And, 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 and know the mind of God. We pray in the spirit around. We, we pray in tongues. And, and when we pray in, the, in tongues, the Bible says that, that you pray in, in the most holy faith. And this is, this is a prayer that, that when you pray in the spirit, it's God, the Holy Spirit, praying for you. And when you pray in the spirit, it says you, you, you pray with groans that only your heart knows and only God knows. And when you pray in the spirit, you're praying God's perfect will for your life. And listen to me, when you pray God's perfect will for your life, he, the answer is always yes. Sometimes if we're not praying, no, always it, when we're not praying God's perfect will, the answer is no. And so, but we, we, in faith, in faith, we say, God, I know that you know what I need better than I know what I need. Y'all stay with me. Don't leave me now. Oh, did he say tongues? Yeah, I did. It's okay. <laughs> Keep your shirt on. God knows what you need better than you know what you need. Faith in God is a gift to you. And if you don't get what you ask for, say, thank you, Jesus. But when your prayer has been heard and the answer is yes, don't say, well, how will I know that? Just say, thank you, Jesus. Zachariah knew that all the people of what all people of faith know that God is not bound by circumstances. That's where you say amen. amen. God is not bound by your circumstances. Amen. God does not need the right conditions or the right formula for him to work a miracle. By the way, we still believe in miracles around here. Too many people try to put God in a box, but God is too great and his plans are way too vast to pigeonhole him into a nice little formula or a pattern. I remember back in probably in the early 80s, we were at a church in Willamette, Oregon, and I was sitting on the platform and it was a pretty good sized church. And I remember the pastor, he turned around to me and he said, Randy, I have a prophetic word for you. He said, someday you're going to be a world champion calf roper. And I'm back there going, cool. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, that was like in the 80s. Well, in the 90s, it didn't happen. And then 2000 hit, didn't happen. I'm kind of getting old. <laughs> hadn't happened yet. 2010, still hadn't happened. And we'd always come down to Houston and show our horse at the, uh, at the stock show in the calf rope. And a friend of mine, he was going to go to the world show in, in uh, Amarillo for the select world show. It's for old guys, like 50 and over. 
And um, he was going, and he invited us to go. So me and daughter, we went up there, and I roped in the world show. And I won reserve world champion calf roper at, in Amarillo, Texas. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. I thought, that's pretty good. Yeah. Well, that's close enough. That's what I thought. I don't know, maybe that guy he just had, maybe he just, maybe he just ate too much bluebell that night and he just, just kind of had an urge to say that. I don't know. But the next year, an opportunity came, and so we went back to the same show, and I won reserve world champion again. So the next time, next year, rolls around, and I go down there, and I win world champion calf roper in 2012. And so, and I'm like, ah, but it's for old guys. It doesn't really count if it's for old guys. Did you know that God doesn't have to do things the way you want him to do them to get your approval? In other words, he doesn't do things necessarily for you, but he does things for a reason. Sometimes he does them for you, but it says, it's how, how much more would your heavenly father want to give, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your, 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 your children, how much more your heavenly father wants to give gifts to those who love him? So he wants to bless us, but it's not always our time. It's not always our way, and it doesn't always happen the, the, the way we think it will happen. So, so let me just say, with Zachariah and, and Elizabeth, they're just like, I just want to burn a little incense. Second Chronicles 16.9, it says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth, throughout the earth, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. His eyes look to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for someone whose heart is fully committed to him. I like that. When God finds people who are committed to him, he's ready to unleash the power of heaven to accomplish his purpose. That is exactly what he's doing with Zechariah here was a man who sought to be blameless, upright, keeping all of God's commandments. And how is he rewarded? His prayer is heard. He's rewarded on, on God's timetable. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, you all know this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you to give you hope for your future. Then I will call, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found of you, declares the Lord. Sweet verse. While it was the dream of every family to have a son who would be the Messiah, Zachariah's son was the forerunner, John the Baptist. He was the one who prepared the way for the Lord. By the way, I don't know if you realize it or not, but you have been selected. You have been selected to prepare the way for the Lord. You have been selected to prepare the way for the Lord with your spouse, with your children, Children, with, for your mamas and your daddies, in your, for your coworkers, for your people that work for you, and in the people that you work for, you have been selected. You are called to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Many people would rejoice at the birth of Zachariah and Elizabeth. They would have this testimony. So listen to this. While the world was tried to make Christmas time of, while the world has tried to make Christmas time to focus on gifts and excess 2,000 years ago, God was preparing us to meet him once again by sending John as a forerunner, preparing us for the day when we would see Jesus. All right, here it is. Having heard the news he, he, that he is going to have a son, here's Zachariah's first response. Verse 18, Zachariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered. This is just hilarious to me. It's like, it's like, I'm an old guy. He's looking at the practical things like, 
I'm just an old guy, and my wife, she's like, really old too. And here's what Gabriel says. He says, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. It's not about you, Zachariah. It's not about how old you are, and it's not about how old your wife is. I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, <laughs> and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news, and now you, you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. He said, for nine months, you're not going to be able to talk. Probably a gift to Elizabeth. Nine months, silence. And God, Gabriel gives Zachariah a pretty sharp review, rebuke. Gabriel does not give him a reason. Listen to this. Gabriel does not give him a reason to believe the promise. Gabriel points to the source of the promise. Gabriel didn't reason with him. We are really good in America. We're really good at reasoning with ourselves. Well, I know you got a headache. Just take some aspirin. Oh, oh you think I should pray about it? I'll just take aspirin. Yeah. It'll happen. It's okay. We reason with ourselves, and we reason about God's ability. Yo, come on with me. We reason about God's ability to do miraculous things. We need to go to him first. Amen. He said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And he, through Jesus, he gave us the greatest gift we could ever have where we could stand in the presence of God. We could come boldly, the scripture says, into God's presence. It says, make your request known unto God. You can do that. You don't have to just like, oh, I don't know if I should ask God. Or ask largely, the scripture says, that your joy may be full. What do you want from God? Talk to him about it. He's your father, and he wants what's best for you, and he wants to give you good things. Circumstances are not a sign of God's displeasure with you. See, they, did, they were barren, and a lot of people go, oh, you're just not a very good Christian because you didn't get what you got. What you. Well, listen, your circumstances are your circumstances. But listen, God's not going to leave you in your circumstances. Maybe even if your circumstances are self, what do you call it, self-afflicted, uh, inflicted, even if it was you, God's not up there. He, he's not going to punish you. He might discipline you, though. He'll bring a little discipline to you, and that's good if you need it. Thank him for it. It'd be good for you. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he said, uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God. This all-surpassing. In fact, it surpasses every kind of power that you can think of. It's from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. Hard-pressed. Anybody hard-pressed tonight on every side? But not destroyed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed in the life of Jesus. So the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Oftentimes God uses our difficulties to shine the light of his power. Sometimes our difficulties are an opportunity for God to shine his power in us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Did you catch that? I will boast about my weaknesses. Now, arrogant, prideful people would never do this. It's okay. You don't have to say amen or nothing. It's true. I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight. I actually delight in my weaknesses, he said. In insults, I delight in insults. 
Y'all come on, you can, you can say amen and get, get, get along with it. And, and sooner or later, it'll get down in your heart if you let it come out of your mouth. He said, he delights in insults. When people insult you, he said, he's, he, you're delighting in your weaknesses. And you can delight in insults. And you can delight in hardships. And in persecutions. And in difficulties. Anybody in difficulties? Yeah, me too. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah. Hmm. God is faithful. God is faithful regardless of your circumstance. Psalm 37, 25, I was young, now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. <laughs> so, you ready for Christmas? That's the deal. There was a, there was a couple of little kids, they was visiting, one little kid, he's from Kentucky, and he was he was bragging about all the gold in Fort Knox. And he said, we got, he's talking to a little kid from Texas. He says, we got, no, we got so much gold, we can, we can build a wall three foot high and two feet wide all around the whole border of Texas. A little boy from Texas, he said, well, when you get through, we'll take a look at it. And if we like it, we'll buy it. <laughs> Your circumstances and your perspective, your attitude will get you through anything in your life. When, when you look to God for strength, when you're hard pressed, when you're perplexed, when you're struck down, when you feel destroyed, when people talk about you, when they say things that are not true or when things, the world seems like it's just against you. I want you to know the place for you to be is on your knees at the altar because your strength comes. You are a much stronger man you are a much stronger woman when you bow down before your, your God. The strongest you'll ever be is whenever you're weak. You recognize your weaknesses. By the way, we're all weak. Amen. We're all weak. Amen. The problem is we don't all realize how weak we are. And then when we realize how weak we are, then we realize how strong God is. But if we think that we're good, that we're, mm, I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not. Nobody's good without God. Amen. Nobody's good without Jesus. We're not strong. But your attitude with God, you can do all things. But it's through Christ who gives you strength. Amen. See, the, the enemy will lie to you and tell you everything's okay when you choose not to follow Christ closely or to be prepared for the Messiah. We think we're ready for Christmas if we have our Christmas gifts. Let me tell you something. It's his birthday. It's not our birthday. It's his birthday. We're the ones that give him stuff because it's his birthday. And tonight, the greatest gift that you can give Jesus, you know, don't you? It's you. He doesn't want your stuff. In fact, he's not really, even, <laughs> I'm sorry, he's not impressed with your stuff either. <laughs> not at all. He's impressed with you, though. He loves you more than you could ever comprehend. But it grieves him, too, when there's no trust, when our response Whenever God moves on our lives, when our response is, how can I be sure of that? I don't know. You know, Thomas, he said, well, he said, unless I can, after Jesus died on the cross, Thomas said, I just, I, 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 I ain't buying it. That's why they called him Doubting Thomas. You heard that. He 
said, unless I see the scars in his hand, the person. You know, and Jesus showed it to him because he knew that's what Thomas needed. He will give you, many times he'll give you what you want intentionally because he wants to show himself powerful on your behalf. He's not a puppet. He's not a puppet. He's God. But he's a heavenly father that loves you deeply. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you humbled yourself. You came down as a baby. And you lived among men. And you, you, you submitted to the you submitted to the Father and, and gave your life. Showed your love for us. You didn't just talk about it. You came down and showed us how to live. We thank you for it, Lord. I'd like for you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a second. This evening, if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, maybe if you have and you just haven't been living for him, here's what the Bible says. It says that we've all sinned. Everybody in this room has sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. But he said this. He said, if we would humble ourselves and confess our sin, that he would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God has done his part. If you've never accepted him as your personal savior, his request and his, he just asks that you do your part. So this evening, if you've never accepted him as your savior, maybe if you haven't, you just haven't been living for him. Simply by raising your hand, say, preacher, I need Jesus in my life. I need to make him the Lord of my life. I want to put a Bible in your hand. Anybody? Preacher, that's me. I need Jesus. Anybody? Would you stand with me, please? We just came out of Thanksgiving and we talked about being thankful, an attitude of gratitude. How many this evening you could say along with me, my attitude? I, I, I need help with my attitude. How many raise both hands? <laughs> yeah. I want to pray for you. Listen to me. Listen to me. When we get through praying here, I'm going to invite you all to come down and, and spend some time at the altar. I, I, I just, I don't even know how to say this. And so forgive me if I'm a little blunt. The greatest privilege you'll ever have in your life is kneeling down at an altar and spending time with God. And I know that there's a lot of people here with a lot of you need to talk to God because you're busy but a lot of times when we get busy we come to church and we act like busy people and we just leave I'm not getting after people that have to go I'm not saying that but what I'm saying is this is an opportunity is that okay this is an opportunity to come down and kneel down at the chairs kneel down at these chairs kneel down at the altar and spend some there's something about praying with God's people you only get to do this once a week and this is a privilege and, 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 and let's, not, let's not just go to talking while people are praying because that's distracting but you love me and we're just whole home folks here now so I'm just going to talk to you like a like a pastor I'm just going to challenge you Maybe you've never come down to the altar and prayed. Maybe that's just not been a part of your deal. Let me tell you something. You do that one time and you're sincere about it, you'll want to do more of it. And honestly, I'm going to say this. It's not really about what you want. It's about what God wants for you. And let's value the altar. Amen.
Now, I know some of y'all have to get on. You got kids over there and all that. I get that. And, it, and you got your altar at your house. And I'm not belittling your altar at your house because that's necessary too. But I'm saying this is a big opportunity. Okay? Let's do that. Let me pray for you. Okay, the ones that have a little, bad, a little bit of a bad attitude, we're going to... Maybe you got it because the preacher got on you, scolded you a little bit. Raise your hands. Let's all, let's all submit to God and surrender to him. Lord, we surrender to you, Lord. We give of ourselves to you. We thank you, Lord for your word in us this evening. I pray, oh God, that you would help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in every area of our lives. I pray, Lord, that your word would go forth from us mightily in this Christmas season. I thank you, Lord, that our nation is turning back to God. I thank you, Lord, for a president that that talks about Jesus. And and I just pray, Lord, that you just help him and help all of our our congressmen and all of our, our local and state government people. Help them, Lord, to follow you closely in this Christmas season. Lord, we celebrate you. We celebrate your word. God, I pray that our nation would turn back to you. Help us as a church to be examples to this world, Lord, the, of somebody that is, is, is sold out to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word that's in us. We pray, oh God, that you'd help us, Lord, to be positive towards you and toward the word that you put in us in everything we do. And we pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. We love y'all. God bless you.